Have you ever seen that desk toy where there's like a little ball of glass and inside there's this little propeller, half of the blades are painted white, half painted black. And when it's in sunlight, it starts to turn. Now, it's not solar powered exactly. It's that the difference in temperature on the white side to the dark side is inducing a propulsion as the thing spins. Have you ever wondered, could this be scaled up to act like some kind of propulsion system? Well, my guest today thinks that there is. His name is Dr. Igor Bargatin, and he's working on a scaled up version of this desk toy, one that could float in the high atmosphere around 80 kilometers altitude. This is actually a difficult place to reach. It's too high for balloons. It's too low for satellites. And yet there's a lot of scientific value that could be had having something hover at that altitude sampling the atmosphere directly. He's been recently awarded a NIAC grant to research this. And so what the final form of this propulsion system will take is still in development. So it's a fascinating conversation. It's very interesting to see how this technique could be scaled up. And we could see giant floating disks in the high atmosphere in the coming future. All right, here's the interview. So this sounds like science fiction. Levitation? <laughs> is this real? Yeah, so levitation is associated with um I believe in more magical fiction than science fiction. <laughs> right, yeah, um, fantasy, okay. From, 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 yeah, so Harry Potter and Garda <laughs> Livio. So, um, <laughs> but in, uh, in sciences, when we talk about levitation, I think the more technical meaning is that uh, it's a flight or a hovering action that doesn't have moving parts. And so we know that things can fly, birds can fly, airplanes can fly, but all of that involves creating um, jets of air often with moving parts, propellers or winds. Um, levitation as it is, as the word is used in science is often uh, based on non-moving parts, or at least, you know, if, if their parts move in, they're not essential to the mechanism. Right. And I mean, obviously, you can have a, a like a magnet floating over top of its opposite polarity. It's not using any energy. There's no moving parts. It's levitating. So it's not, you know, completely Harry Potter. Yeah. So superconductors are, are um, a common example. You can you can make uh, either a superconductor float above a magnet or the other way around, a magnet above a superconductor. Uh, you can levitate diamagnetically. You can levitate, which is a somewhat similar mechanism to superconductors, um, graphite. You can have a, a piece of graphite floating above magnets using a similar approach of excluding the magnetic field. Um, that said, you know, there are many other approaches there. You, you can levitate using longer range electrical interactions and so on. What we are working on is making things levitate by shining light on them. And that's why where the word photophoresis comes from. So photophoresis can be translated from Greek as roughly light induced motion from the words for light and the word for motion. And um, what it what it is, is the mechanism where um, an object that is illuminated by sunlight or another fairly intense sort of sort of uh, source of light can create airflow or gas flow around it. And that mechanism has been around for a hundred years. Um, and there's a nice little toy called Crook's radiometer. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar. It's sometimes I was, I was called just a about to like say that as bulb. an example. Yeah. It's this little light bulb looking thing yeah. with a little fan inside. And then as it warms up, it has black panels on it and it starts to spin like a little propeller yeah. inside this, this enclosed sphere. Exactly right. So, so that's the force. Uh, it has different names, which is somewhat confusing. Photophoretic, radiometric, sometimes called Knudsen force. They're all essentially the same thing. And if we're talking about Crookes radiometer, you know, invented, I think, by 
it's Sir William Crooks, I believe, in England, probably 150 years ago. <laughs> um, and since then worked on by many famous you know, scientists like Maxwell and Einstein. So I think we know how it works. And if you, if you put this device into sunlight, there's a black side to each vein and a white side, and the black side warms up, as you said. And then the molecules that hit the black side, they actually can absorb some of the heat, and that means that they're leaving with a higher velocity than they came in with. That means there's an exchange of momentum, as we say in physics, and that means that there's a reaction force, a recoil, if you will, acting on that black vein and so it ends up pushing there's a force that's pushing on the black veins and it can make this um, assembly go around it's it usually rotating fairly fast in direct sunlight now that force however is still probably about a hundred times smaller than the weight of those paper veins so you can make things rotate on a low fric low friction spindle but you cannot levitate you can cannot overcome gravity uh, and so our goal was to actually create structures that can. Uh, can we improve the design of the structure, the, the materials, um, to make things levitate using just the sunlight? And so that's that was the focus of our work um, for the last few years. And we started by making a structure that we call nano cardboard, which is a hollow structure made of very thin films that is about a hundred times thinner than uh, paper hmm. and i'm sorry a hundred times a hundred times lighter than paper <laughs> how right, thick right. it is is sort of depends on how yeah. you define it but yeah um but it is very light and as a result it can actually float so we did some experiments where it's floating in uh at atmospheric pressure above a surface kind of like a hovercraft then we moved on to experiments where uh, similar structures can levitate uh, above a wire mesh and then eventually more more or less in midair. And so what does this thing look like? Like, you know, as a as a vehicle, uh, as a as a is it look like a balloon or like a like a flying saucer? What does it look like? Yeah, it looks like a disc to a very large extent. Um, you could probably compare it to a flying saucer. In the experiments that we've done so far, it's, we're mostly focused on things that look a lot like a disc. Um, but I think if our goal is to actually use it to carry payloads, carry something useful, some sensors, um, then it probably would have to have a different shape. And we just... Um, posted a preprint and papers under review about how can we maximize the payload by, by using three-dimensional shapes. And if you do that, then in fact, it does start look, to look like a balloon or a parachute structures that are not just a disc, but rather curved and perhaps form a jet uh, that can be high speed and therefore maximize the force. And so what is your proposal? Like you've received a NIAC grant. What are you investigating for NASA? Yeah, so the NASA proposed the NIAC proposal focuses a lot on what missions would be enabled by this technology. So we have some experimental data already. We have some theories about how you could uh, maximize the payload and get to maybe a kilogram or, or a few kilograms of payload, which is enough to carry sensors and communication devices. But the question is, you know, what, so what, right? So <laughs> what do you, what can you do with it? So it is a new technology in the sense that right now, between roughly 50 and 100 kilometers, nothing can fly for any extended period of time. Right, so the balloons and the airplanes, their maximum altitudes are about 50 kilometers. And then uh, satellites, they very rarely go below 150 kilometers in altitude. So we're in the region where the air is too thin for airplanes and balloons and too thick for satellites. Um, rockets go through that region. Um, but usually they're just passing through very quickly for a few minutes at most. And so we are 
offering a way of staying aloft in that region of the atmosphere where nothing currently can stay aloft for an extended period of time. And what we're what we want to figure out with this project is not only, you know, how do you how do you carry the best possible payload, but what signs can be enabled it? Like what what are the new things that we can learn? Now is the does the air pressure like the lack of the air pressure I mean, that is your propulsion, is that you are firing away higher energy particles from the atmosphere. Does the lack of atmosphere cause you, like, degrade the performance of the propulsion system? Um, it turns out that the atmosphere should be um, ideally at, at one specific pressure if you want to maximize the payload capability and the force that you can create then uh, it needs to be you know on the order of 10 pascals it depends on the design you you can adjust the design to some extent but we're talking about the pressure not being too low and not being too high and it just so happens that the pressure is at which this force can be maximized is exactly the region which we call the mesosphere where nothing else can fly right now so so, so actually your ideal pressure I, I think, is at that high altitude that's right um so i think our ideal pressures for the maximum payload are probably at about 80 kilometers wow which is sort of in the middle of that of that range that's really interesting and and so you you've been able to create a structure that that can fly with this weight does it still is it still able to fly at the lower altitude or do you imagine requiring some kind of balloon or rocket to raise it up to its operational altitude yeah so that's a great question how, how do you get it up there right so once once it's there it can uh levitate but how, how do you get it there in the first place and so that's one of the other things we want to look at as a part of the NIAC project, like what's what's the deployment mechanism. Um, there are a few ideas. You know, one is a balloon, especially if it's a balloon that can go to, you know, roughly 50 kilometers. Um, second one is what's called a sounding rocket, which is a rocket that um, doesn't go into orbit, but rather goes uh, into a suborbital flight and then you can release it at the same 80 kilometers or so so a lot of uh, new commercial space um, ventures i think are looking at sending rockets to about 80 kilometers I, I believe that's one of the definitions of space right so even if you go up uh, to about 80 kilometers which is 50 miles technically that makes you an astronaut i believe um, or at least you, you know gives you some serious bragging rights. So there's a bunch of private space tourism companies I think that are they're looking at going up to these altitudes, and there may be opportunities to catch a ride on, on hmm. some of them um, as a way of deploying at those altitudes as well. Right. So fly on um, uh, Blue Origins the final... and then deploy the spacecraft when you reach your the apogee of your of your height and then the spacecraft returns and now you're just hovering at that point exactly yeah for example on blue origin um and then the the probably the craziest idea is whether you can deploy by dropping it from a satellite um and typically things that re-enter from orbit burn up mm -hmm. uh and you have to you have to be very careful about designing re-entry vehicles to avoid that fate. But it turns out that if your structure is extremely thin, it does not happen. Uh, um, so our structures are typically about a micron thick. Um, and there are a lot of meteorites that actually enter the atmosphere. They're called micrometeorites. And nothing much happens to them as long as they're smaller than you know a few or a few a few tens of microns um only the big ones heat up so much that they actually burn up and become a shooting star 
those are typically I think uh, an inch or so in size or maybe maybe an eighth of an inch so a few millimeters to a few centimeters will get you hot enough to create a shooting star in the sky but um, the the tiny ones they just slow down and then they fall to the ground and you can collect them on the roof of almost any building there's a lot of space dust on all around us and so the question is if you if you create a parachute like structure um, that is very thin and it's also carrying a relatively light payload can you re-enter from from orbit without uh, significant thermal or mechanical damage and so if if you could drop it from orbit there then you could also um, deploy it later on without a dedicated um, rocket going to the part of the world where you want to deploy it deployed. so what could you use it for so you've got these uh, flying saucers or or jets or whatever shape you have them in they are i guess hovering at the mesosphere carrying some amount of payload what applications do you envision for these there's a co-investigator on the nasa award who is working at nasa goddard her name is um ruth liberman and she uh is an atmospheric scientist so we've been talking to a bunch of people who are um, interested in atmospheric science and trying to figure out what are the possible things that would be useful for science and it turns out that yeah the the flows in the atmosphere at these altitudes are not that well understood and they're pretty difficult to observe so if you could get the data with high enough spatial and temporal resolution so you know sampled frequently in time as opposed to say twice a day which is often what you get from satellites um, satellites can measure certain things in the atmosphere at these altitudes but not frequently usually and then um, and then uh, if you send a bunch of these probes at the same time then you can kind of have a, a spatial resolution on top of that so temperature um, data is very interesting wind data is very interesting gas concentration data is very interesting you know the mesosphere is one of the fastest cooling regions in the atmosphere uh, as a result of global warming it's sort of counterintuitive but what happens is the carbon dioxide which sort of blankets the earth and creates the greenhouse effect once you go high enough um, it's it starts emitting directly into space the the same infrared radiation that it captures when it's coming from from earth layers from the ground um, and that actually cools some layers of the atmosphere as the co2 levels rise so you you can measure how much of that there is and that has a direct effect on um, how the atmosphere cools itself and so you can use these to verify the models for for global warming in situ that's right yeah um again with the with the resolution that's currently not available at all um there are lots of other phenomena i believe uh i'm not working on this at all but um there are lots of gravity waves that are called um not to be confused with gravitational waves that are detected from uh, black holes they're gravity waves which are essentially like waves of the ocean but with atmosphere so there there are these waves sloshing around hmm. um, the whole earth pretty much and I think uh, some of them are synced to the 24-hour day cycle but some of them are multiple or or a fraction of those and then you could have uh, some of these waves also be affected by the topography below so if there are mountains then those waves uh, can be affected and they can create a big bulge and so from what I hear yeah go ahead I was gonna say it's, it sounds to me like like a lot of the applications for satellites come into play as well uh, communications relays Earth observation, navigation, assuming you can miniaturize the electronics and keep the payload under the, the maximum mass that these things can carry. 
Yeah, that's one way of think about uh, to think about it. The other way is to think about applications for balloons and what are those used for and and how um, what's going to be different if you can take a balloon like structure higher. Um, so satellites obviously usually go around very quickly at the orbital velocity, right? So it's not going to stay above you unless it's a geostationary satellite, but the geostationary satellites are, as a result of being synced up to the Earth uh, rotation, are pretty far away. Mm -hmm. like they're, I forget exactly how many, but probably about a hundred times further away than, um, than the low Earth orbit satellites. And that causes delays and it causes obviously the the signal to weaken a lot compared to a satellite that's as low as as it possibly can be. Um, so, yes, yes, navigation, yes, um, um, observation. You know, you can look down on Earth. You can take pictures. Um, so all of the all of those are options. The question is, like, what can you do that it's not already possible with satellites, for example? Well, but I think there are a lot of downsides to satellites that as we're seeing the rise of Starlink and we're seeing thousands and thousands of satellites in low Earth orbit, we're seeing a increase in light pollution. It's it's causing a pretty big impact on astronomers. And obviously, there's always this concern with orbital debris, although it's not that much of an issue at the low Earth orbit, like where the, the Starlinks fly. It's much of a worse issue up at the higher altitudes. But but if these things are flying at, say, 80 kilometers of, of altitude, they're not going to cause that much light pollution, right? Because they're going to fall into the Earth's shadow almost the same moment that the surface of the Earth falls under the shadow. And yeah. if there is any problem with them, they just flutter to the ground. Yeah. So in fact, that's one of the limitations of the technology is that at nighttime, they lose the lift generation ability, right? Since right, it's photophoresis, it's, it's uh, light driven. And so um, one of the ways to handle this limitation is to design missions that are, for example, over the Arctic Circle uh, or an Antarctic region, and so that that would allow you to operate during the polar day, which takes you know, which lasts many months. The other one is to design missions that are limited to several hours, and there are many balloon missions, for example, that are relatively long, uh, short. I'm sorry, about, you know, several hours. Um, I think is pretty normal for the the weather balloons that are launched to sample what's going on with the with the atmosphere at the lower layers so yeah there, there's a there are opportunities and things you can learn about possible missions from both both the balloon side and the satellite side because there there's some similarities with both also i think about say infrared telescopes like nasa recently canceled the sophia instrument and now there really isn't a, a great Earth-based way to see infrared and still recover your instrument and upgrade it and so on. So is there any way around that limitation of, of you not being able to last through the night? Yeah, potentially, but at the cost of reduced payload. Uh, I think in principle, it should be possible to design a structure that will settle in the atmosphere and then rise. Um, and if it settles slowly enough that it can last through the nighttime, um, then during the day it can rise up. That's actually what some of the balloons do. They have this diurnal cycle where during the day they kind of heat up and then at night they cool down and that actually causes um, elevation changes for the, um, for the big helium balloons. So it's so it, like some kind of hybrid balloon structure that is using the balloon to get as much lift as it can and then using this method to go even higher taking over from where the balloon gives up but then as it starts to sink down the balloon stops it from completely crashing to the surface so i'm, I'm thinking about a structure that's now completely detached from balloon so you, you could use a balloon to launch it um, to get to the altitudes where the mechanism can operate first. But then after that, I'm just thinking about something that 
rises during the day and then like a feather slowly falls at night and then rises during the day okay. and so on so in that case you're not relying on the balloon action uh, by itself because at those very high altitudes the air becomes so thin that it's really hard to make the balloon mechanism work right right um but you know, I th what I was trying to make the analogy to is that some of the balloons do a similar motion up and down, right. even though they still have the, the regular lift at all times. But I, I guess, you know, with this kind of technology, I mean, there's a lot of other ideas that have been put forward to sort of exist in this range. Like, I'm, I'm a big fan of this idea of the air breathing ion engines. I don't know if okay. you've, you've looked into these, right, where they're they're sucking in particles of the atmosphere there. They're then accelerating them back out with an electric field. And so they don't need to carry a propellant and they're getting all of their electricity from the sun. So you've got something that can kind of operate forever, but it, but it wouldn't be able to come down as low as what you're proposing. It would be much higher. So I believe the ion propulsion would probably require a pretty heavy structure mm -hmm. and, and as a result um it's going to require a whole lot of power to to stay aloft so i've seen some um you know discussions of various ion engines and and the power power requirements often are are massive we're talking about megawatts of power um, if you want to create a lot of thrust with the little bit of air that exists in, in these very high out layers of the atmosphere and it's hard to collect that much power right i mean we we get about a kilowatt a little more at high altitudes from the sun per square meter um, so if we're talking about you know, megawatts, then you, you're talking about a thousand square meter solar panel with a hundred percent efficiency, which, you know, you're not going to get. So it's probably, you know, what would that be? Probably 50 by 50 meters or so, just solar panels uh, to get to a megawatt of electricity. So yeah, there, there are some other ideas uh, out there um, and they all have challenges uh in, including ours um i think the the somewhat um att the rather attractive part about what we're proposing is that it doesn't have it's not a whole lot of complexity it doesn't have a lot of power requirement beyond just the light and uh it's a, actually a very thin structure that is essentially a film so it doesn't require a big um you know, so a big frame that separates the electrons from the ions and, and shoots them out at high speeds. Yeah. I mean, there's just, there's all these separate technologies and they all work at different ranges of the atmosphere from the thick part of the atmosphere through to lighter parts of the atmosphere to vacuum and being in orbit. It would be nice if there was just some way that they started to overlap so that you can sort of move from field to field. But I, you know, it's possibly that I'm, you know, back to Harry Potter here at this point. <laughs> um, but so what about other worlds? So what about say Venus? It feels like a place that's closer to the sun and still has a thick atmosphere. It sounds like the ideal world for this. So Venus is going to have the uh, um, layers of the atmosphere where you could you could use this approach. Um, Venus, of course, would also accommodate regular balloons without too much trouble. Um, so I think I think that's that's a possibility, and I think a, a bunch of balloon missions are currently planned for Venus. Um, the question is, you know, what what is the thing that you can do floating at higher altitudes than what balloons can? Well, it has that long day as well. Right. Yeah, it's, it's. I think, uh, I'm trying to remember. I think Venus is like months and months, right, mm -hmm. for, for a day. Um, so Mars is the one that's actually closer to the, the uh, air densities or gas densities that were optimal at can operate optimally at so mars the surface of mars it, it corresponds to roughly earth's atmosphere at about 35 kilometers or so a little over 20 miles if i remember correctly and so that's um that's where you can still fly conventional um aircraft and that's why 
the ingenuity helicopter you know it it took a huge effort um but it's still you know 35 kilometers or so on earth if you wanted to explore regions of mars that are way higher than that if you wanted to have something fly on top of the highest mountain on mars the mons olympus then i believe you can you wouldn't be able to fly a helicopter there or an airplane or a balloon just because it's way above what's possible even on earth and then actually on on top of olympus mons i think the pressures are roughly optimal for the kind of propulsion mechanism that hmm. we're uh, offering so i don't know what is the real reason to be on top of olympus months and moreover flying over it maybe like, i don't think you need a maybe. reason it sounds so, awesome so, some really cool youtube videos maybe yeah um, so you know if we can raise a few billion bucks maybe that's right uh, the way to go but but i guess with with mars you've got a lower gravity so yes. you, you have less propulsion that you need to kick yourself up and you have that thinner atmosphere, but then at the same time you have less solar irradiance at that point. That's exactly right. Yeah. So I think you have less sun and you have less gravity. So roughly it's a wash. Um, so you, you don't necessarily win or lose by going to Mars compared to being here on Earth. Um, yeah. But, but I mean, having a device at Mars that can be sampling the atmosphere directly could help answer a bunch of questions about how, how Mars lost its atmosphere. What is the source of the methane that's been discovered there? It sounds like there's a lot of applications. Yeah. And I, and I've talked to some scientists at NASA about, you know, what are, what are the most interesting things you could study and, you know, why hasn't it been done yet? Uh, and I think it's on Mars to a very large extent, um, we're just limited by um, what tools are available, right? And there's so much to study, like there's so much yeah, yeah. that is still unknown about Mars compared to Earth. The question is, what is what does NASA have budget for to put on their you know, next vehicles that are going to be launched is we now have a helicopter. Um, you know, can we, are we going to ever have balloons on Mars? I mean, it's technically possible. As I said, you know, we have balloons on earth that can go pretty high. The question is what can you do with it? And is that the best use of taxpayers money? So I, I think, yeah, there, there's certainly options that um, would be available using our technology that are very different from what would be available with a, with a helicopter or a balloon on Mars. You could access a very different altitude range. Um, but the question is, you know, is that really the best thing to spend uh, on in terms of scientific impact? There's a lot of good ideas competing for a ride on the next you know, missions to Mars. Well, I guess that's the question you'll answer with phase two of your NIAC proposal. So I guess we'll, we'll find out. Yeah, I think, I think the goal is to, um, you know, further develop the ideas about uh, not only missions, but also this, the structures um, and the materials that can be used. Where can they go? You know, what kind of information can they collect? So if people want more information, if they want to see maybe some examples of, of your prototypes and stuff, is there a place that people can go to, to see what you're working on? Sure. Yeah. So we have a website um, for my research group where there, there are some videos um, where people, that people can check out. Wonderful. Well, Igor, it was a pleasure to talk to you. It's a fascinating concept, and I look forward to the results of your research and see what applications this might have. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word. There are no ads and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent and keeps ads at a bare minimum. Them. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. 
And a special thanks to Jay Dennis, David Giltonen, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Andrew M. Gross, and Josh Schultz who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.